Welcome back to this podcast edition of 12 Days in March. This material was delivered during a series of live lectures at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this recording, we'll review the key features of clostridium-related myonecrosis and necrotizing fasciitis for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. All right, soft tissue infections. These are, again, I was stubborn, but I don't want you to be stubborn. Just grab these. These are easy questions if you just put in the math. Wait a minute, we're going to do the math right now. So we're going to start with C. perfringens, and we're talking about gas myonecrosis, okay? So it comes, there is a spectrum. Moon contamination, forget about it. They're not going to ask you that. Anaerobic cellulitis, you need to know because that's going to be the infection that's going to predispose to this myonecrosis, gas gangrene. So you get this perfect storm of myonecrosis. So you need a traumatic injury that introduces the bug. You need devitalized, traumatized tissue, loves that. And what they want out of devitalized tissue is no oxygen, right? They put the N in anaerobic. They don't want oxygen, so they need no oxygen. So dead tissue introduced and delay in therapy, boom, then you get gas myonecrosis. Tissue necrosis, no inflammatory response, and there's no inflammatory response in part because of the toxin, but in, in part because, again, that little microthrombosis, small vessels thrombose, so you're not getting blood in there. If there's no blood, there's no inflammatory response, or it's a relative um, paucity of response. Gram-positive anaerobic rod. So gram-positive rod, you don't want those. Four forming exotoxins. And they want you to know the exotoxin. This is about the exotoxin on the next slide. We love anaerobic tissue death you need. Cellulitis supports the growth of the organism. And then ultimately, it spreads along tissue planes, fossil planes. No bacteremia. This is local. It's myonecrosis in the tissue planes. Invasion, destruction of healthy muscle tissue, trauma, vascular compromise. So here's the toxin. This is the one I got tired of getting wrong. This alpha toxin, referred to as a lecithinase, that degrades lecithin, essentially phospholipids. Um, so it's a hemolytic toxin. And then also described with phospholipase activity. So lecithinase, phospholipase activity, alpha toxin, all talking about the same thing. Catalyzes splitting of phospholipid molecules that causes cell damage, cell death. And they've actually, I've seen questions in the QBank where they're specifically talking about a toxin. How does it work? What does it do? And look right here, I have a little arrow. It splits cell membranes. It phospholipase destroys membranes, and that's how it kills cells. Now, as part of the myonecrosis, you need those occlusive vascular aggregates that expand that anaerobic environment. No PMNs get there, so it's relatively non-inflammatory. It also, and they're not going to ask you about this, how it causes adhesions of PMNs, and they're not going to talk to you about platelet aggregation, but the only reason I mention it is to underscore there's no blood supply. It's devitalized tissue. It's an anaerobic environment. There is this other toxin it makes. I'm not seeing get a lot of action. This is the money. Gas is the buzz phrase. Vascular occlusion, dead muscle, minimal inflammatory response, and it's all because of that alpha toxin splitting these phospholipid membranes, and you're going to have these hemorrhagic boli. So that's C. perfringens, and it, everything is kind of focused around that um, toxin. Clues, severe pain, tissue ischemia, crepitus from gas bronze skin discoloration, large bullae, toxicity, multi-organ failure. A diagnosis, gas on imaging, blood cultures are going to be negative. In the, in the tissue, you can see the gram-positive rods, but no pus because there's no response. And the treatment is major surgical debridement. Antibiotics play a small role here. It's all about surgery. They're not going to ask you to treat this damn thing. They're going to ask you to make the diagnosis, and they're going to ask you about the toxin and have the toxin cause the problem. Okay. The organism also, perfringens, actually also causes some watery diarrhea. It's like, how does that make any sense? But it does. It makes an enterotoxin that causes diarrhea. So those are the two places we're going to see this organism listed. And here's your summary. Gas in the soft tissue, uh, traumatic injury, crepitus, the toxin, how it works, and just a sidebar, you got this enterotoxin. All right, almost done with infections. So now we'll do necrotizing fasciitis. So necrotizing fasciitis is a different infection. Now, this is a different bug, and, and it can, can be confusing. So necrotizing fasciitis, soft tissue destruction, shock-like presentation, muscle fascia, subcutaneous vat, as opposed to myonecrosis, literally muscle tissue. So shock-like presentation, similar. 
different organism. This is group A strep, strep pyogenes, different tissue, fascia and fat, not muscle, and no gas. This is an aerobic infection. So not to confuse the two. And this truly let you know the treatment. This is a patient with necrotizing fasciitis where obviously surgical debridement is the mainstay of management. I have no idea what happened to this guy. That's not pretty. And if you can go your whole life without having your leg look like that, I'd highly encourage it. It's usually monomicrobial, uh, not polymicrobial, unless there's a reason like diabetes or so forth. Uh, so group A strep, staff can do it too, but group A strep. They'll describe group A strep. You have to know that. I listed, I went apeshit on the PDF there, just talking about virulence factors on group A strep. It's not that important for necrotizing fasciitis, but they do like to ask these questions about the organism. So it spreads along fascial planes. The over, this is the horrible part. The overlying tissue can appear normal. So here you have these people coming in with this horrible pain and signs and symptoms of toxicity, and it's like... They're looking for Percocet. They're pain seekers, okay? They're not pain seekers because this is deep. These people are sick of stink. Pain out of proportion to physical findings. So maybe you get some swelling. Maybe you get some warmth, okay? Progresses over a short period of time without involving the overlying soft tissue. Okay. This also causes vessel thrombosis with, and this is the bad news, can extend into the nerves like thrombangitis obliterans, and you get the, the nerves get numbed. So the pain, as the infection gets worse, the pain can get better. And you can wind up with compartment syndromes. Surgery is the treatment. There is no diagnostic test. You have a clinical index suspicion and tear them apart. All your tests are looking for other things. You're looking for signs and symptoms of shock. You're looking for signs and symptoms of sepsis. Okay, surgical debridement, 100% mortality without debridement. So let me say, I haven't really given you anything juicy on necrotizing fasciitis, I don't think, compared to uh, clostridia. Um, and so the questions themselves have to actually walk you there. They have to get you there and give you some very specific kind of questions about strep pyogenes and what makes strep pyogenes escape the body's immune response. They have to go off on derivatives on necrotizing fasciitis because it in and of itself doesn't necessarily stand out even though it's a miserable infection. Clostridia does because they go after the toxins. So those, those are the infections. And that concludes this discussion of soft tissue infection for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.